right, you guys. We are back. Two ghosts from the past here to continue on with a a series that I get asked about often. A series that a lot of people still enjoy. The 2002 pay-per-view reviews. How you oh, doing, man. pal? It, it, you know what? I, I, I thank you for doing that intro because uh, it, it's been quite some time. I mean, I know you guys just recently just saw me do an interview with Jay Bougie, which you guys can watch that with the uh, descript- um, the link in the description down below. So, yeah, we are officially back, uh, continuing on with these 2002 reviews, picking up right where we left off. Uh, if you guys don't know, Danny Bryant here, along with DVD Freak, and we are here talking about Rebellion, uh, one of the last, one of the last of many uh, UK pay-per-views. Um, as this was the last UK pay-per-view in 2002. And unfortunately, uh, WWE would uh, discontinue the UK exclusive pay-per-views by the time 2003 came along, which is very unfortunate. You could definitely tell that WWE was going into what this this new direction where they were just like, you know what, UK pay-per-views, you guys want them, we're not going to give it to you. Even though they weren't really the best pay-per-views, they were kind of like one of those big house shows that were just, you know, recorded live just to say, hey, for your entertainment, we're just going to put this on a pay-per-view. And um, honestly, this one, it definitely wasn't one of my favorites, but the only reason I would say that this was enjoyable was this was the first SmackDown-only uh, pay-per-view. Yep. Um until going on, and then they would do it for, like, the next seven months or so. And SmackDown around this time had a very hot streak. They were definitely better than Raw. Um, Their rosters were stacked, uh, technically, you know, high flyers, uh, especially when it came to um, their Divas. I mean, they weren't really considered Divas matches back in those days, but more like uh, cat fights, as Taz would say. But you know, around this time, you know, you would you would have to be a fan around this time to understand the enjoyment of the SmackDown roster, um, especially with three guys on this roster in particular, um, with Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, you know, just some of your cult classics. Yeah, 2002 to me is one of the golden periods. You know, uh, 2002, 2003, even 2004, SmackDown was the A-show. I don't give a shit. I don't want to hear what anyone says. It's fine if you want to say Raw was better. Different years around that, that's fine. But this was the period where SmackDown was hot. It was on top. You had the SmackDown 6. You had Paul Heyman on the team. You had Stephanie McMahon as the GM. You know, you had a lot going for it. And this was kind of Stephanie's kind of first big test to see if she could be like a real kind of on her own on screen performer. Yeah. And I believe it was just around this time that Vince had introduced Stephanie as the new SmackDown GM. So, you know, throughout her tenure as SmackDown GM, um, she definitely did not disappoint. And, um, you know, it's just one, like I said, it's just one of those things that you just had to be there for to experience, to just get that, you know, that type of action and, you know, type of, you know, so so much words I could describe about 2002 and the SmackDown brand at that time, you know, just a very baffling thing, you know, so much words that you can use to describe. But anyway, 2002 Rebellion, this took place October 26th of 2002. Manchester Arena in Manchester, England. For anybody who really cares about the, you know, the audience, the attendance, uh, thirteen thousand four hundred and sixteen fans. Supposedly, I mean, God forbid we we believed it back in the day, right? But you know, it's kind of one of those things now where we kind of just pick right back up and we're just like, eh, you know, not necessarily accurate, but it looks like it. You know, they played it off very well. Um, right off the bat, before we even get into segments or anything, 
it just felt like a house show right off the bat. The stage literally looked like they went to a Walmart and was like, all right, we need to just find a bunch of shit and ram it together and make it look like it's from the UK. That's what this is. Like, it has that house show feel to it already. Um, well, well, I tell you what. I mean, presentation-wise, you probably would have never thought that. But, I mean, I guess you would say it was somewhat better than their global warming uh, pay-per-view. Yeah, that was barely... I wouldn't even consider that a pay-per-view. That was more of a special event. Right. So, that's honestly one of the things you just got to be there, you know, just to witness that. But um, let's get on with the first match. Uh, Matt Hardy taking on Booker T. This was uh, a way of SmackDown exchanging talents. Uh, Big Show, I believe he did one thing for Raw, and Booker T did one thing for SmackDown. Uh, Originally, I believe it was supposed to be Matt Hardy versus The Undertaker. Uh, There was kind of a uh, beef going on right there. Um, But kayfabe Undertaker was out. Obviously, he was doing his thing between Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman. They had broke the Undertaker's arm. And Stephanie McMahon had announced uh, in the beginning of the show that Undertaker couldn't make it. But I believe, in reality, um, Undertaker was expecting his child. Yeah, it was Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. Before she got covered up on his neck. Oh, boy, you better hope that's not DDP's kid. I mean, I'm just saying, I would take it for Hey, man, the timing was kind of, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, let, let's get into this match. Um, one thing that I did like, I'm not sure about you. Obviously, this was probably one of the first, uh, probably one of the first main pay-per-views as Matt Hardy as a singles competitor. Uh, this was obviously the time that WWE was like, hey, you know, let's finally give him a chance. Because prior to this, Vengeance 2001, you know, they kind of hinted at a Hardy boy splitting up. They had that one-on-one match. Lita was the special guest referee. And Matt Hardy was showing, you know, a lot of heel tantics. You know, they were expecting Matt Hardy to portray his brother. But then by the time early 2002 came along, Royal Rumble came along, they just, you know, scraped it. Acting like, you know, nothing ever happened in typical old Vince McMahon McMahon fashion. Um, Until the summer of 2002, where basically it was just, you know, Matt Hardy turned on Jeff. Uh, Matt Hardy was then traded to the SmackDown brand. And pretty much after that, it was, you know, let's see what Matt Hardy can do. You know, they brought up the whole Matt Hardy... uh, You know, Matt Hardy facts. You know, what is Matt Hardy like? Matt Hardy doesn't like. Um, I would say. Matt Hardy likes English muffins, according to Rebellion 2002. (laughs) You know, you know, typical uh, England fashion, I guess you would say. But um, as hyped up as a match, I guess you would say this was, um, it wasn't bad. It was a solid opener. Um, Slow start that. Kind of picked up here and there. There was many close falls, many close finishes. You know, Booker T hitting the bookend. Matt Hardy had his foot on the ropes. And then we had Matt Hardy trying to attempt to twist the fate. Booker, he, Booker T counters, or should I say Booker Tits. Yeah, um, it's Booker Tits on this show, pal. Yeah. Excuse me. I should have elaborated on that. But um, hits him with the scissors kick. Hits him with the one, two, three. You know, typical... Uh, Babyface fashion, you know, salutes to the fans with a, a good old uh, Spinner Rooney. And uh, that was practically the last time we would see Booker T on the SmackDown brand until he was drafted in 2004. Yeah, he got a decent little pop. You know, it was a little surprise for the crowd. Um, yeah, I, this was just kind of your, it was realistically just like an exhibition match, you know. Um, so, for what it was, it was a decent opener. Good way to have a fast, not like fast, but a nice, decent pace match to start you off hot with the crowd. And then we just go downhill from here. Yeah. And then, uh, basically, earlier in the night, it was announced that uh, not only Brock Lesnar, 
but we would also have um, Paul Heyman involved in the main event for the WWE Championship in which, you know, he storms into Stephanie's office basically just saying, like, hey, this isn't fair, you know, yada, yada. I haven't even brought my trunks. I haven't brought my boots. In which, you got to really sit there and think, did Paul actually keep a pair of trunks and boots aside just in case that, you know, this shit would ever go down? Yeah, that's the joke, man. That's... Uh, you know, obviously, Stephanie McMahon comes out of nowhere and she just says, hey, listen, life ain't fair. You know, the, the typical response you would say to some whiny bimbos who just think life is just not fair just because it's not going their way. But, I mean, let, let, let's jump to the main event a little bit. I, I want your honest thoughts about this because 2001, obviously, we would see Edge break off as a singles competitor. Uh, we kind of got a glimpse of what was yet to come of Edge as, one, he would win the 2001 King of the Ring. And basically, it would just showcase him um, just to see what he's mainly capable of. And, you know, this is his first taste of main event gold. I believe this is the only time I ever seen him around his time go for a world title. Yeah, it's like the... It's like I remember in uh, what was it 2017 TLC where everything got moved around and all the matches just felt awkward because of circumstances. This was basically that's how this felt. And um, um, Edge, this was kind of to me a test in a way. Can you hang in the main event? You know, let's see how you work with the top guy right now. So it, it was a good test for him and. It was definite foreshadowing on who they saw as the future. Right. And, I mean, unfortunately, we want to really see Edge capitalize on any type of gold, world heavyweight gold, I should say, until New Year's Resolution 2006, cashing in on John Cena after the Elimination Chamber match. But, you know, around this time, you really got to think about it, too. You know, the head booker for SmackDown, or the head writer, I would say, it was Paul Heyman. So, if it wasn't for Paul Heyman, I don't think Ed would be anywhere near responsible for gaining any type of goal. But then again, I mean, you don't know. I mean, I'm sure Vince grew a liking for Edge as time went on. But it, it's kind of just one of those things. It, it's kind of one of those awkward things watching this pay-per-view and you go, wow, you know, Edge is actually going for a world title here. And, you know, he hasn't even reached his peak at this point. And obviously, a couple months later, he would be sidelined with a th with a neck injury um, until returning to the 2004 draft um, after WrestleMania 20. So. Yeah, he missed two WrestleManias. That's that's hard. Yeah, and he, you, you know who, who who knows? And you know, coming coming with this other question too that comes to mind: um, Do you think Edge would have received a world uh, title match anytime sooner? Um, if he wasn't sidelined with nagging injuries, I was going to get into that next. Yeah, I think that severely, like, just put an end to the momentum. Um, it delayed it. I think, you know, maybe around WrestleMania 19, because remember when he did the WrestleMania 19 media tour? Yeah. He was a, I, I don't know, is that foreshadowing? Maybe he was supposed to be. Maybe in Booker T spot. Um. Then again, I mean, if you really look at the card too, um, Rhino did replace um, Edge as Chris Benoit's partner for that Triple Threat tag team match. So I know for a while Benoit and Edge kind of had their thing going on. Uh, I know it was supposed to be like him and Benoit and Lesnar at the 2002 No Way Out uh, pay per view when they were supposed to face the. Uh, uh, team angle, but I mean, who knows? I mean, we can't really go back in time and say, hey, you know, let's make this happen and let's not have him have a neck injury. But I mean, it's nice to see where Edge's career, you know, went down as the years went on, especially today. You know, a guy who just came out of retirement well, just last year. So, um, you know, it's great to see him back in the ring. Same thing with Christian. 
You know, another guy that you never thought would you would see in the ring again. I know I'm going off topic here with this pay per view, but you know, just looking at Christian too. You know, it's like making his appearance at the 2001 21 Royal Rumble match, and then all of a sudden now he's world champion for Impact Wrestling and fighting for AEW. Yeah, he just he literally just had a main event with Kenny Omega as the Impact champion. Only six months, well, well, what, eight, nine months now after being in the Rumble. Like, that's incredible. And I remember he made his debut in, at what, the March pay per view, right? Revolution. Yeah. That's when he, had, he was that big secret signing. That was only months after, like, the Rumble. So that's kind of badass. He had that really cool moment with Edge at the Rumble. Like, they just hogged because they're like, holy shit, we're both out of retirement working in the rumble together so yeah they've i I think christian's had a phenomenal year edge i i'm not a big fan of him since his return uh he had a good match with seth rollins decent wrestlemania main event match that's about it right and you know who, who knows what lies next for both men i mean christian's still world champion um edge is kind of in that float right now as he just got done facing uh, Seth Rollins at SummerSlam, which was great, uh, especially with the entrance with the Brood. Um, definitely brought some back some memories. You know, I, I, think I did pop felt, for that. I, I think my heart felt some type of warm feeling there. I did. Anyway. <laughs> that was the only good feeling I got that entire pay-per-view. <laughs> uh, and Brock Lesnar's ponytail. Uh, oh, we're not getting it. Between Brock Lesnar's ponytail and John Cena's bald spot, uh, I don't yeah, know. that was that rough. Was but anyway, speaking of John Cena, we're, let's get into the next match here. We have a uh, intergender tag team match: uh, Billy Kidman and Tori Wilson. Which back in the day, they were actually a real life couple. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, we seen some smooching after this match, but yeah. Billy Kidman, Tori Wilson, uh, taking on John Cena and Dawn Marie. Um, obviously, this was all because of Tori Wilson finding her fully clothed father in the showers with Dawn Marie. Yeah, and, you was, know, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> Dawn Marie tries to break it off, but Al is such a damn stud that Dawn Marie just can't resist the LD. So, um, obviously, this was an early... John Cena. This was before he was rapping, before he was a, uh, you know, he had just turned heel and turned on Kidman um, just a few weeks prior. And uh, just looking at John Cena from this standpoint, you know, would you ever thought that he would have been the face of the company within two and a half years from this point? No. <laughs> This is literally the middle of the card on a rebellion pay per view, an intergender match. This is about as low as it gets. He got a stock renewal. Something happened. Like, he cashed in his chips and filed for bankruptcy and started over. And he even admitted that. He, he said, like, in the very good uh, Ruthless Aggression documentaries, um, when's volume two coming, guys? That's been a while. But yeah, he even said, like, him randomly rapping on a bus and Steph overheard him and that that literally is what saved him from being cut yeah which is so crazy because as you said you know the ruthless aggression documentary if you guys haven't checked it you know check it out right now if you have it on dvd you check it on the cock network um but yeah you know was kind of you know hanging for defenses here as you know he basically didn't know where his career was going at this point as he basically just had no gimmick. He was basically like your generic, you know, big stud muffin that, you know, Vince loved in the door. He loves his big guys. But, you know, obviously, you if you have no gimmick, you're not really going to make it too far. Imagine uh, living in a world where he didn't get the rapper gimmick and he was cut and he just there was no John Cena. What would the wrestling business look like? Well, I mean, Cena not rapping, not being involved in the main event picture, um, being cut 
by the end of the year. Um, obviously, Lesnar would end up leaving within like a year or so. Um, yeah, um, it, it definitely would have been a different time in wrestling. But, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, down the road, I mean, you had other guys who came from the OVW system with uh, Randy Orton and Batista. So, Shelton Benjamin. I, I, Shelton Benjamin, yeah. I mean, I think they would have been okay. I mean, obviously, things would have turned out great for Batista. Maybe Randy Orton would have been world champion multiple times going for, forward after 2004 SummerSlam. Um, but you know what? I mean, you, you never know. But we're stuck in this predicament with him in a tag team match. Um, the one thing that really bothered me about this match was, you know, the, the, the fans whistling in the crowd. All you can hear them is whistling at the women who were in the ring for like a straight five minutes. And I'm just like, you guys act like you never had women in your country before. I'm just like, well, what's with all this? What? That was probably the most time I've ever heard whistling from the fans from the outside. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was more entertaining, though, to be honest with you. So <laughs> this was just, it's an embarrassing nothing match. And then, like, you just, I, I just don't understand how he got Tori Wilson. I really just don't. Can we talk about that? That's more interesting to me. Is that relationship yeah. dynamic? Well, I mean, they had their thing back in WCW, obviously, before WCW was bought out. Um, and I think they ended up being with each other for a while. I'm not sure how long. Um, I, I know it wasn't really that long. I want to say maybe like a good seven or eight years. You know, they had this thing going on. But, um, yeah, you, you know what? It, it, it's kind of weird, too. Like, even if you look at the uh, the opening package for this pay-per-view, you actually saw some glimpse of Billy Kidman in the uh, opening package, which is something that you don't really see. Because, uh, to me, Billy Kidman was definitely one of the most underrated talents at that time. Ray always said that was his favorite tag partner. Yeah. You know, it's crazy, too, because, you know, I just feel like his career was just cut way too short. Um, obviously, after, like, 2005, he ended up getting released and would end up getting a backstage role with the company. I know he did some stuff after. Uh, I know he had a match with Heath Slater during his time in FCW. Uh, if you guys want to check that out, me and Freak actually did an interview with Heath Slater back in January. So, link in the description will be down below for that if you guys want to check out that and check out that story. But, uh, one thing about Billy Kidman, though, don't ever set that man up for a powerbomb position, because I guarantee you he will reverse it. Yeah. So. It's like one of those uh, urban legends in wrestling. Well, yeah, I mean, every time you have seen Billy Kidman set up in a powerbomb, he would, you know, hit you with a, a face buster or an X Factor or with or whatever. But didn't 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 he actually take? Didn't we make that joke a few like reviews ago? He actually took a powerbomb for once, and we were shocked. Yeah, and I I think it was from Slater. I I think he had said something about that. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, if my memory serves me correctly, I, I believe it was that. Okay. Um. Uh, wow. Chain What's the up. next match, pal? So, <laughs> obviously, Tori Wilson and um, Billy Kidman would get the win here. Uh, going into the next match, you know, kind of have that comedy, um, comedy match here, as we would have Funaki taking on Crash. Um, you know. Funaki was kind of over at this point as being SmackDown's number one announcer. And, you know, Crash Holly kind of doing his gimmick that uh, Eric Young would end up picking up during his TNA days, you know, just being like this goofy, outlandish character. Um, you know, he makes Funaki, you know, he makes fun of Funaki's karate. You know, he gets punted in the face. Crash sucker Funaki's to the floor and, you know, hits him on his way out. 
Uh, Funaki fires back and misses a drop kick, and you know Taz gets bored and does his Gordy Gordon Soli impression. I'm not sure if you caught that. Are you a fan of horror movies? Necronomicon Ex Mortis, the Book of the Dead. We're all cult classics. Your move, creep. If you are, you'll love shocking things. Please search for us on all the major podcasting platforms. To see our social media and a direct link to our podcast, just go to anchor.fm slash shocking things. Yeah, so basically after the tag team match, um, we would get a little promo from Edge basically promising to make the most out of his, out of his first title shot, um, something that we did mention here earlier in the show. Um, like I said, it, it's just very hard to believe and, you know, very hard to see Edge in this title picture so early into his WWE career. You know, this was obviously before the rated R gimmick uh, would come in full effect. But, I mean... I mean, Edge would definitely get a lot of promises, you know, within the next four years after that. So we would definitely see him in the main event pitcher very, 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 very often. Yeah. So going into our next match here, you know, kind of have a comedy based match here with Crash Holly taking on Funaki. Um, Funaki had, you know, quite a following as being SmackDown's number one announcer. You know, Crash was basically just doing the same gimmick Eric Young does um, in TNA, you know, during Eric Young's TNA days. That's, you know, just being this awkward individual. Um, You know, obviously he makes fun of Funaki during this match uh, with his karate and gets punted in the face. Uh, Crash sucker punches Funaki to the floor and, you know, hits him on his way out. Funaki fires back, misses the drop kick. And then uh, during the duration of the match, you hear Taz with his uh, Gordon Soli impression. So, what, what were your thoughts on those uh, Gordon Soli impressions? Uh, <laughs> oh, no comment. Um, you know what? They should, you should have channeled Kung Funaki. For this match. Do you remember Kung Fu Naki? Oh, yeah. That was oh, God. later on. But... Oh, God. Um, so, I don't know. Do you... Funaki's still around to this day. I don't know if you know that. I, he's still doing announcing for their, on their what, Japanese announce team, I think yeah. he's doing. Yeah. I, so, I, like, I, he's, I, I, I has he been employed this that. entire tenure? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, When's the last time that you actually watched the WWE pay-per-view and the WWE pay-per-view basically introduced every international commentary team? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's been a, a good while since we've seen that. Um, I mean, I can only imagine Funaki's still employed. I mean, maybe he just can't leave the country. Maybe he's just doing some stuff in Japan, WWE related. But who knows at this point? I mean, who knows what the hell he's doing. And uh, obviously we would know the unfortunate circumstances for Crash Holly as he would basically pass away, uh, you know, just a year prior to this pay-per-view. So, um, yeah, his um, – I liked Crash. You know, I think he he could have had a resurgence somewhere, I think. And you know what? He was just coming back, too. You know, by, yeah. by the time he got released from WWE in 2003, you know, he obviously went to TNA during its early stint. I, I think he was known as Mad Mikey, <laughs> uh, which was interesting in a way. I mean, they, they had him do some stuff with Shark Boy, and he had some other matches, and obviously it didn't work out for him. And um, accidental overdose, uh, choking on his own vomit. Yeah unfortunately but um yeah uh funaki would end up getting a win this was probably like a five and a half minute match um good comedy match just something to ease up and relax to as i you know not to get the fans so hyped up right away so going into the next match here uh cruiserweight title uh this was obviously um 
SmackDown specialty. This was SmackDown's secret weapon uh, when it came to the brand. All right. This match, I have to rant a little bit. Okay. I like a three-way dance, but I don't think I want it in WWE. I want just triple threat rules because the, the bad thing about this was Tajiri was gone so quickly. Yeah, about like two minutes in. You yeah, know, so I was pissed. Them. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, <laughs> I was uh, pissed. Like, don't do elimination with Tajiri. Like, no, like, just give them a good 12, 15 minute match. Triple threat rules, you're good. Right. That would have been perfect. So, for anybody who doesn't know who, uh, the participants in this match, it was Tajiri, Rey Mysterio, um, and Jamie Noble for the Cruiserweight Championship. Um, I, I like the start of it. I mean, Ray tosses Noble out onto Jerry and hits him with a corkscrew pl- plancha. Um, one thing that I liked about this, um, the difference between this Ray and the Ray that we're all familiar with today, um, is pretty much measured in, uh, you know, light years. You know, Ray Mysterio was a lot faster. This was obviously. Um, before all the nagging injuries with his knees and everything, you know, Rey Mysterio could go. He oh, could yeah. definitely go. He he had some grease lightning or something, or Crisco in his boots. Who knows? But, you know, around this time, uh, Ray had just joined the company back in June. Or, no, July. Excuse July. Me. Uh, he had come in July. Uh, Vince McMahon decided, hey, for marketing purposes, let's give you back the mask, which something that WCW should have never done in the first place was get rid of Mysterio's mask. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. All right. What I will say, though, is WCW Rey Mysterio or ECW Rey Mysterio are like my two favorite versions of him. Um, I always really loved his WCW theme song. Do you remember that one? Um, It was kind of like the... Uh... Well, depending on which one you're talking about, because the only one that comes to mind not is... Not the rap one, the one... Oh, it was like... When he still had the mask. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, that was cool. I always loved that one. I always wanted to see him come out to that again. Like, that would have been good to use it, like, all in or something. Or, like, if he ever went to AEW, just use that. That'd be so cool. <sighs> you know, AEW, I don't know. I mean, they've been acquiring a lot of people lately for, you know, guys who just saw All Out. Um kind of got a little treat with uh, Adam Cole coming out of nowhere, um, which I don't think a lot of people expected to see him so early as he had just got done with his WWE contract. His contract just expired. And now he, here he is back with the elite. And um, obviously we would see the fan favorite of uh, Brian Danielson making his appearance which I'm so happy about, but the one thing that doesn't bo- the one thing that bothers me about his um, debut for AEW was uh, his entrance. I was really expecting to hear the final countdown. I was expecting to, you know, yeah, her up, man. Like, come on, that was like the best part about Brian's entrance back in the Ring of Honor days. We're so off topic. Yeah, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> the thing about Rebellion, but. Yeah, the, the thing about Rebellion, um, we're going to get into the next promo here, or excuse me, uh, basically after this match, uh, this match took place, it was like about 13 minutes long, um, you know, Matt Hardy came along, uh, Ray gives Noble and Nidia double stuff 619 to get revenge, um, and obviously this would set up Matt Hardy's course and you know being a cruiserweight competitor which was kind of funny I mean it was still cool don't get me wrong I mean I I loved Matt Hardy um you know during this course of time with the V1 gimmick but man uh the, the cruiserweight division was just so hot back at that time you know definitely brought back the old WCW days um especially with some of the guys that they would acquire down the road um WWE would actually pick up the Ultimo Dragon um, further down the line, which obviously didn't really work too well. Psychosis they picked up. Psychosis. Super crazy. Super crazy. Kid Cash. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, Paul London, Kendrick. They just wasted, like, 
uh, like um, half the guys we just named, like people just forgot. They had them coming out on lawnmowers for fuck's sake. Like, do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> My God, like, just this is why. Like, this is why there's no hope. So. This was something that I was kind of looking forward to talking to you about because I know you have a very dark sense of humor. Oh, boy. Let's talk about this. In the back, we had Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit arguing over who is the captain of the team. You know, Kurt basically just saying, hey, I'm American, so I'm the best. And Chris is just like, well, I'm Canadian. And Kurt just hits him with the, well, I put my career ahead of my wife and kids, so I'm a worse husband and father. And Chris was basically just like, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously. We and then would, we got the punchline five years later. <laughs> yeah. A very bad punchline. Vince is uh, like, oh, that's what he meant by that. <laughs> Jesus. But, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? I love the connection between Benoit and Eagle. You know, they had such good chemistry. Whether they were opponents, whether they were tag team partners, um, which they were the first WWE SmackDown tag team champions uh, as they won the belts at No Mercy 2002, which was basically the last pay-per-view that me and you reviewed. Um, You know, I I can't help but praise that match to, you know, oh my gosh, like that was probably one of the best tag team matches, you know, of that decade. Yeah, I think it's still my favorite tag team match ever. But um, speaking of tag team matches, very, very odd tag team match. Yeah. Val Venus and Chucky, Chuck Palumbo, taking on Devon and Ron Simmons. Not Farouk, <laughs> Ron Simmons. Yeah. Um... Okay, Damn. I mean, obviously, this is the year 2002, because you have Devon taking, you know, teaming up with Ron Simmons, and obviously this was in the heist of the first branch split, as a lot of tag teams were split up during this course of the year. Uh, in the draft specifically, you had the Dudley Boys split, Bubba Ray ended up going to Raw, Devon ended up going to SmackDown, in which... Basically, Devon was this became this evil preacher that uh, Vince basically p- uh, pitched out to him um, on an episode of SmackDown. Uh, Ron Simmons, you know, he was still known as Farouk, but you know, obviously, he was only using his real name. Uh, as him and Bradshaw were split as well during the draft, uh, Bradshaw would end up being a member of the Hardcore Division, winning the Hardcore Championship on numerous occasions. At one point, calling it the Texas Hardcore Championship. Um, obviously, that wouldn't last long. The Dudley Boys would end up reforming uh, at the next pay per view, which will be the next pay per view we review after this uh, Survivor Series. Hell and uh, Ron and Bradshaw would end up getting back together, but obviously, we would see this whole new look on Bradshaw with basically just him saying, hey, guys, I just joined the stock market, so I just had to shave my beard and dye my hair um, just to make myself look reasonable. But let's get into this tag team match. Devon, you know, he was kind of in the twilight zone between gimmicks. Obviously, like I said, he, you know, he was that evil preacher gimmick, which he dropped, um, which I still kind of find that character a little bit interesting. Because let's just put it this way. If it wasn't for Devon, uh, we probably wouldn't have never been introduced to Batista. Leviathan. Leviathan or Deacon Batista, as he was known. You know, guy had the uh, the collared shirt, you know, torn yeah. off sleeves. And, oh, God, he just looked like somebody's mistress. You just never know. But he was a foster child. Yeah. And, uh <sighs> You know, Ron Simmons was using his real name for some reason. Don't know why. But, you know, that must have been considered the key to the drawing money because, you know, Val Venus would drop his gimmick and become Sean Morley soon after that. And sadly, Billy and Chuck broke up because Billy was on injury reserved. 
that's another tag team. Um, you know, that, that tag team had, I wouldn't necessarily say controversy. I mean, they had that whole wedding scandal thing and Eric Bischoff would, you know, Eric Bischoff, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but I don't think we'd ever thought it would have been Eric Bischoff inside all that rubber. That whole segment was gold. I don't care what anyone says. That whole segment was amazing. And they were, I loved them as a great, they, they were a great team. I loved them as a team. I liked them individually. Um, I was never a Road Dog fan, so I preferred this over New Age Outlaws. I'm sorry. But, and, and you know what? I mean, I and I feel bad for Chuck because he kind of got lost in the mix. Because obviously this, is, this was his post-gay um, <laughs> After that, I mean, I, I don't mean to put it that way, but I mean, obviously, that's what it was. Um, Experimentation period. But during this match, you know, you had Simmons, you know, hands out some spine busters early on. Uh, Chucky came back with some jabs to the face, you know, that were basically just like on a roll, you know, obviously a true Guido fashion, which that's probably why they hooked him up with the FBI. Um you know, Simmons clocks Chuck from the floor, allowing Devon to roll him up with a handful of tights. This match was about four minutes. Barely seemed to get started before it finished. So, I mean, not that I'm complaining, but I mean, yeah, I, yeah I'm good. That could have went on a little bit longer, but then again, you you practically just had four guys who were lost in the shuffle. I think. <laughs> yeah, this was like, I don't know what this was. This was catering, like. And, you know, Chuck Palumbo, you know, he would have his fair share with the main roster as, you know, he ended up being let go in 2004. But then coming back in 2006, 2007 with a lot of people tend to call him the wannabe Undertaker when he came back in 07 with the biker gimmick and everything. But in reality, that was Chuck. You know, he was a handyman, you know, yeah. he liked, loved working on bikes. You know, the guy has built houses. He has his own YouTube channel now. I can't recall the name of that YouTube channel, but, like, obviously he does, like, his own handcraft work and everything. And um, c- kind of crazy to to see, like, later on, Chuck would have uh, Michelle McCool as his manager for a brief time. Yeah. Like, Ooh, she really loves bikers, huh? Um, I mean, hey. obviously. Obviously, I mean, look, look who's, I mean, look at what the guy he's with now. I mean, <laughs> uh, but overall, the match wasn't bad, but, you know, obviously it ended before it finished. It's a house Very show good. match. The next match, the kiss my ass match. Literally, the kiss my ass match. Because mm-hmm. we have the biggest ass in this match. Rikishi taking on Albert. And obviously, I see nothing good coming out of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, in more ways than one. And this was pre A Train. Obviously, this was probably like one of the last times we would see Albert as Albert before you know WWE decided, hey, we're gonna call you A Train. Which I mean, I was okay with. I mean, I, I think the only thing that really bothered me about A Train was his pubic coat you know yeah i always liked the smoke that would come out when he came out that was always a cool little touch and uh it's better than lord tensai or sweet tea yeah he, he's done worse things is he the is he like does he have the record for just the most just the worst gimmicks ever like the wrestler with the no, most bad gimmicks honestly, i would i would probably put brutus beefcake at first Because you got to look at Beefcake. I mean, he was actually known as Hulk Hogan's cousin. I think he was like Rand. No, not Randy Hogan. I'm thinking of somebody else. But I know he had Hogan in his last name like during his early stint in the 80s. But then obviously later on he would be Brutus Beefcake, which, you know, the Barber Beefcake, which would be his best gimmick. But then, you know, he would be known as the Zodiac, the Booty Man, the <laughs> You know, just a handful of gimmicks that just, they weren't necessary. And it was just like, ah, like, dude, what are you doing? It, oh, 
There's my signature catch. <laughs> there you go. What are you doing? The guy for that uh, coming in full effect. But um, yeah. Um, going into this match with Kishi and A Train or Albert, whichever you want to call him. Um, I don't know. I I I just feel like WWE just threw all these matches together because they were like, oh, this ain't a real pay per view. You know, let's just throw in. You know, these stipulation matches, that way the Manchester crowd can just have us, you know, good old time. You know, a jolly good time, mate. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I really don't have any words for this match. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I don't really have many words for it either. <laughs> it's yeah, I'm, Obviously, we would see Rikishi. I, I, don't, I don't like stuff like this kiss my ass matches or kiss my foot matches or hog pen matches anything that are just like really just out there this is the stuff i don't like this is a lot of the reasons why i don't like the attitude era all that much right and this is post attitude era but this was still kind of like like a I seed mean, like it was a root of it you know like it was still clinging yeah <laughs> um Rikishi would get the win after hitting the bonsai drop. Uh, seven seven minutes. Albert refuses to kiss Rikishi's ass and low blows him, but Rikishi avoids Albert's attempt at a stink face and make him, you know, toss his salad. I guess you would say. Uh, Rikishi dances with all the announcers, and uh, it's pretty much as predictable as you can get. The dances are amazing, though. Michael Cole's like, eh, Shivani's like. Eh. Dude, they're you all know, getting into it. I, I guess you would definitely say that was a happy point in Michael Cole's career. Yeah, just, he was Michael, having a time of his life. Mike, Michael Cole nowadays is, is something that you can only tolerate a handful of times before just saying, all right, changing the channel. Yeah. But, you know, back in these early days, it, it wasn't it, bad. It was completely different. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure if it has anything to do with age. But, I mean, God forbid he was on top. Him and Taz were gold together. You know, I would do anything to see him and Taz as a commentary team one more time if WWE chose to do a proper SmackDown, you know, anniversary show. Yeah, okay. But, like I said, you know. Yeah, I don't ever have. They hate Taz now. nowadays. Yeah, not so much. So, the next match which I would practically say was the best match on the card. I'm not sure about you, because this was definitely the longest match on the card. Uh, tag team titles on the line. Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit, taking on the Los Guerreros. Um, yeah. What, what else can we say about this match? I mean, it definitely wasn't better as the Mysterio and Edge match. But this match definitely holds up. I mean, many close calls, hot tags, you know, Germans to, you know, headbutts. This match is gold, I would say. I mean, this match was 16 minutes long. And it's one of your typically awesome tag team contests from these four. And they just seem to wrestle each other every week. In late 2002. Um, I don't know. This one's just one of those ones that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Because it's not as good as the others. As the No Mercy one. Or even the Survivor Series one. So, yeah. Like you said. You know, these guys were always wrestling each other. Like Benoit and Angle. They'd keep going until the Rumble. You know? Yeah. And, and that's my favorite. That might. That's probably my favorite wwe match of all time Ooh. wwe wise that yeah. or kurt angle and Shawn michaels wrestlemania 21 oh god i, I mean it, like i said just a handful of matches that you could just select from but i mean when it came to these four or i mean if you include edge and Rey mysterio obviously those guys were the the well john cena as well i mean you had your smackdown six but uh, obviously these guys week after week always put on a clinic, never disappointed. But uh, I mean, for the tag team titles as well, I mean it, it was cool. 
I, I mean, it was definitely cool. Um, and uh, Angle and Benoit would pick up the victory here. Um, and this wasn't long before until, you know, the, Smack team, uh, the SmackDown tag titles were changed hands at Survivor Series, in which we would finally see the Los Guerreros uh, win some gold as they were basically in the early stages of the cheat to win gimmick, I guess you would say. And yeah. low riders came in effect and, you know. Ugh, the main event, we're finally here. I, I I mean, it may not have seemed that long, but we're, we're finally here. We already talked about most of it. I mean, we talked about most of it, but, you know, this was such an early stint in Edge's career with getting this opportunity, you know, against Brock Lesnar as well. I, I You know what? I think this was, like, probably one of the only times we actually seen Lesnar and Edge face off. Yeah. Which I definitely wouldn't mind seeing again. As long as Lesnar doesn't break Edge's neck or put him back into a retirement home, um, we should be good. We should be go. But... You know, for obvious reasons during this match, you know, Lesnar starts, you know, basically just shoves Edge around, you know, and he looks really mean, you know. And this was like back in the day where Lesnar was an intimidating force. He was the next big thing, you know. He 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 had a hot streak. And this was actually around the time that Lesnar gave a shit about his wrestling. We wouldn't see German suplexes after 15 times and then three F5s. You know, the, the way Lesnar wrestles nowadays, it's like putting in a cheat code. Yeah, I do this. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, no, it's that kid at the arcade who just does a button combo to beat everybody. Just just keeps doing, just doing leg sweeps on Mortal Kombat. Oh, boy. But, you know, the referee, I mean, obviously this is one of your typical matches as the referee would get knocked out. You know, Edge review, uh, reverses the execution. One, two, three, but there's no ref. Edge, uh, Heyman slides a chair into Lesnar. Brock lifts him up, but Edge ducks under and hits the spear. You know, another one, two, three. Like, no, you know, there were so many close falls in which so many times where Edge could have got the, the three fall. But obviously, you know, Edge goes up again. Brock grabs the chair, hits him in the gut while the referee recovers. F5 gets the finish. This match was about 18 minutes. So um, disregard my last uh, statement with the tag team match. This was actually the longest match on the card. Um, But I tell you what, Edge doesn't get nearly enough credit for being able to play both face and a heel really well. Because obviously this was around the time where he was still a face. and he was practically the fan favorite. I mean, early on in the in the show, I mean, we didn't really receive that big pop from Edge. So obviously, this was still the processing phase of, you know, what we what WWE can do with Edge as a main eventer going forward. And you know, this match honestly, it, it kind of reminded me a, a lot like. When Sting used to face Vader in the WCW days with Edge hitting every high flying move he could, you know, he could think of and Brock surviving and overpowering him. Well, I think he wanted to show off every bit of his like capacity. Like he wanted to show everything off because this was his opportunity to show everything off in his move set. So let's do it, you know? Let's put on a show. He was taking the opportunity. And uh after the match Heyman grabs the chair, prepares to dish out some more punishment. Instead, Edge boots the chair back in his face and gives him an execution, um, which was a very, very frequent finisher that Edge used to perform back in the day. Um, But overall, um, before we get into the final score here, the final letter, lettering grade, um, there was always a big difference between the haves and have-nots in 2002 of SmackDown. Um, The guys who were really good, you know, as I mentioned earlier, your SmackDown 6, and, you know, let me include Brock Lesnar because he was pretty much the main event guy in this picture. 
you know, they were really good and really over. The rest, not so much, but not because they weren't talented, but just because they were lost in the shuffle. You know, you had your cruiserweights. I mean, as I said early on, Billy Kidman, one of the most underutilized talents um, at that time, despite being one of the top cruiserweights down there. Um, obviously, I, I could never see Billy Kidman go to that next level, whether it was like a mid card or a main event. He, you know, he was always good as an opener or like a midway card match. But, um, you know, Val Venus and Chucky and, you know, Simmons and Devon, it was kind of just like, you know, SmackDown was missing that tag division because the only main tag teams that they had at that point were Los Guerreros and Ben Juan Angle. They didn't really have any big tag teams at that point. Split them all up. So you split them all up. I mean, obviously the APA would be. Uh, would resurge in early 2003. Dudleys uh, would get back together. Yep, Dudleys would get back together. But like even going further into the SmackDown brand, uh, we would enter. We would be introduced to other tag teams: Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, world's greatest tag team, quote unquote. Um, which they were good. I want to say great, but they were good. Uh, the Basham Brothers. Um, mm. Uh, try and think of other tag teams. Um, wow, you know, it, it's been so long since I've watched the early SmackDown brand. You, you know, I can't really think of any other SmackDown tag teams around that point. Uh, Renee I, Dupree and Mark Jindrak, right? Were they one? Yeah, uh, but I mean, that wasn't really, I mean, that was like later on. Um, oh, no, I think you mean Renee Dupree and uh, Kenzo Suzuki. As they were the uh, SmackDown Tag Team Champions, surprisingly, I don't know how that came to be, but um, yeah, um, but SmackDown had a hot streak. You know, they they were definitely better than Raw at this point, and you know, going further with this, you know, the Cruiserweight match was good. Obviously, you had your fair share of opinions with it when it came to, um. The style of match being an elimination, I mean, I would have much preferred to just have triple threat rules in which, you know, whoever got pinned won that match. Um, the tag match was excellent. The main event was pretty good. I mean, for Edge being part of his first main event, I mean, it was pretty good. And the rest just felt like fillers. But obviously, you know, those matches are enough to earn a mild recommendation. I guess you would say. Okay. So, I would go C minus. Yeah, I'm gonna give this a C minus. It was good. Um, but obviously some of the fillers in this match kind of just threw it off. You know, it just made you feel like you were watching a two thousand two pay per view or like a early two thousand pay per view where they just throw this, you know, this random competitor who you were pretty much a fan favorite of. But you wish they would have done more. Yeah. And, you know, this was just kind of an excuse to have a SmackDown pay-per-view in England. Honestly, it just felt thrown together. It's it's just, it honestly just feels like a house show. I, I can't, there's no other way to describe it. You know, there's no title changes. There's no, there's no big angles here. It's just a live event. To entertain the fans overseas. Yeah. And they're like, well, we might as well just save some money and make this a pay per view. That's what this feels like. We'll fly Booker Tits over, give it give it a little star power. So, uh, yeah, I just, it just feels like a random house show. And you remember those tag team matches? What was it? Strange Bedfellows matches? Yeah. That's how this felt, too. Like, this just whole pay per view just felt off. Yeah. So like I mean, it was in Bizarro World. Honestly, it did. And you can probably see why they dis- they uh, they discontinued with these uh, type of events. Uh, in Direction 2003 would end up being the last UK exclusive pay-per-view. But 
I mean, if you were over in the UK, I mean, I'm pretty sure you would probably get a hit out of these, especially if you were there live. But, I mean, for fans, you know, who are up here in the, you know, up in America here, um, I mean, it's not so much. I mean, it's something that you can watch. It's something that you can enjoy, but it's something that you can highly praise. It's nothing that's worth mentioning, like, in your tops or in discussion. But, I mean, overall, I mean, for 2002, A, I mean, it's my favorite year. I mean, your favorite year. It's our favorite year. So we're not going to sit there and complain about it. Obviously, there's going to be a few nags here and there. But, hey, that's just the world of professional wrestling. It's a love-hate relationship. So, yep. But I think we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, our next review, Survivor Series 2002. That's going to be a good one. Definitely yes. better than this one. So we are officially back with the 2002 pay-per-view reviews until we roll into the new year. Um, and, you know, this felt good. Felt good. You know, it, it's been some time since we've done one of these, but uh, definitely felt good to do this uh, for the podcast. So um, shout out to Rick for, you know, having such a great platform for us gentlemen to perform on. <laughs> Couldn't wrap it up better myself. And that pretty much does it, guys. If you guys want to follow us, our social media links will be in the description down below. And until next time, this has been the PWZ Podcast. See you around.